Begin our evening service is we're a little bit light as far as the auditorium goes tonight. We've got several members that are uh, visiting other places. Several of our family here is involved with the home of recovery there in Winsboro, and they're having some activities, I think, in, in Mount Vernon tonight. So some of them have, have gone over there to support that. And we're glad that you're here. Hoping to trust you had a good afternoon. I'd like to repeat a few announcements from this morning uh, for the benefit of those that might not have been here or uh, we was not able to tune in on, on the internet. We extend our condolences to the Cheryl Seaman family, Cheryl and Steve. Uh, Cheryl's mother passed away the first part of last week, but her funeral was yesterday afternoon. And uh, we uh, uh, send our concerns toward that family and Cheryl during this loss. I mentioned this morning about Sally Nelson. She is still in rehab, uh, trying to recover enough health at least where she can have heart surgery in the near future. Uh, she's in the rehab facility in Tyler. And so Gary's been going back and forth, spending some time, most of the time as he can down there, and then come home for a day or two and then back and forth. But remember Sally as well as Gary uh, in, while they're in this facility. Sybil Buck had hip surgery this past week. That's not in your bulletins. Uh, she is recovering at home and uh, that's going to be a fairly lengthy process for her recovery, but uh, she's got that behind her now. It's just a matter of, of getting getting well. And I want to mention uh, a lady, young lady, or I guess not all that young either, but Angie Brown. Uh, Angie is, many of you probably don't know her, but people that have been here for any length of time will remember Wavon Griffith. Wild Vine was a former member here. She passed away probably eight or nine years ago. Angie is her daughter. And Angie is being diagnosed uh, with uh, brain cancer. I'm not sure how extensive it is. I was just told that she had it and they have asked that we as a church family remember her uh, in, in our prayers. And so when you go home tonight, you say your prayers, you remember people specifically, you might put Angie Brown on your, on your prayer list. This morning, uh, Kelly Vaughn responded to the invitation. Kelly acknowledged the fact that he had done some things that could have very easily have brought shame or reproach upon the church. He wanted to make that right, and, and he sought forgiveness from the church family here. So we appreciate the heart of Kelly Vaughn. Order services tonight. H.L. Robinson will wear our first prayer. Heath Hines will dismiss us. Larry Reynolds is going to let her sing it, and we're going to ask Larry if he would while he's up here to also I sort of direct our thoughts in the communion service uh, at the appropriate time. So with that said, let's start with the word of prayer, then we'll turn the song service over to Larry. Larry. Yes, sir. Brenda Banks. Remember. Brenda Banks, and I forgot about that. Is uh, she had surgery or going to have surgery? Have some kind of surgery. Do what? Some kind of surgery Tuesday. I don't, I don't She's know. having it Tuesday. Uh, I think it's Tuesday. It's, it's well, the first part of this week. week. Yeah. And that's, that's the mother of Brandy Fight. So we need to remember... Uh, Brenda Banks in our prayers as well. She's a member of the church over in Mount Vernon. Our Father in heaven, we come before you at this time thanking you for another day that you've given us to live, for the blessings of the day, for the beauty of the day, and the opportunity that we have of gathering together this evening as your children. We ask that you will be with us in our efforts this evening to offer up worship to you that it will be pleasing in your sight that we will gather together and offer up our praises to you in the proper attitude and the proper spirit and that the things we do will be in accordance with your will. Father, we've mentioned several tonight that are in special need of uh, uh, your care as far as their health is concerned. 
Often we don't really know what to pray for, so selfishly we ask that you will make these people well and restore their health, that your will be done in all things, and give us the strength and the courage and the uh, knowledge to accept your will in all things. Continue to love us as your children, and, and, and continue to bless us as you see we're in need. We pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Number 708. 708. Be the first and third. 708. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the big Jesus has said.
Father, go with us now as we go through this service. Be with Larry as he brings the lesson tonight. Father, be with this country that we may overcome the hardships that we have and that we grow together and grow under your name. Father, give us, forgive us of our sins. This prayer we ask through Christ's name. Amen. Number 255 be the song of invitation. We've been in the process on Sunday evening studying the life of David, and we're going to continue that line of thinking tonight. If you have your Bibles, we invite you to open them to 2 Samuel, chapter number 9. We'll have to serve as our text this evening. 2 Samuel, chapter number 9. Things seem to be falling in place for David, finally. If you recall, for a long time, King Saul has been chasing David, trying to take the life of David, and David been able to elude him. And finally, King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in battle, and David was able to control at least part of the reign of the nation of Israel. And it took a little while, but eventually he was able to uh, become the king over all of Israel. Jerusalem was now the stronghold of the capital city for David. The Ark of the Covenant has been moved to the successfully to the city of David. In, uh, in the first part of 2 Samuel chapter number 8, there were various battles fought, and David won all those battles in the military strategies, and he just won one battle after another. And the greatness of David was beginning to reign. In fact, chapter 8 of 2 Samuel, verse number 15, toward the end of that chapter, it says that David reigned over all Israel and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And the rest of that chapter, six, several verses, talks about people in important uh, positions, officials that he had put in place while he was king. But there's something that seemed to bother David. And we see this in the first verse of Acts or 2 Samuel chapter number 9. He is a little bit concerned about what happened to the family of King Saul. And David said, verse number one, Is there any that is left in the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David wanted to show kindness to those people that were descendants of Saul. Where does this request come from? Why would he ask such a thing? And further, what a surprise request that is when you think about it. Most kings, when they take the reign, they want to destroy all the family members of the predecessor so that some of their family might not try to claim the throne. So you would think that David would want to destroy all of Saul's family, but that's not the case. David does not ask if there's anyone in Saul's family remaining so that he could kill them. Instead, he asks, is there anyone that he can show kindness to? And here's the reason. Because of Jonathan. I've got a book in my library that Freddie Anderson, who helped a meeting here several years ago from Huntsville, uh, wrote about the friendship of Jonathan. And it shows the closest between Jonathan and David and the relationship that they had. It's because of Jonathan that David is wanting to show this kindness. See, he's referring to a covenant that he and Jonathan had made some years earlier. When Jonathan was trying to help David elude the assaults from Saul, Jonathan said, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 and 15, it's a little bit difficult to understand in the King James Version. I want to read it to you. And then I will tell you sort of how it's worded in the, e in the easy standard version. But King James says, 1 Samuel chapter 20, beginning of verse number 14. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not. But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from the house forever. No. Not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. 
In essence, here's what Jonathan was saying to David when they made this covenant. If I continue to live, treat me with the Lord's faithful love. But if I die, don't ever withdraw your faithful love from my household. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. And this is, David, if I die, take care of my family. Take care of them. When it seems David is remembering this, this promise comes back to his mind now that he has the kingdom under control and the kingdom is in his hand. But many in the house of David, or in the house of Saul rather, have already been killed. A lot of them had lost their lives in battles. And so David asked the question, is there anyone remaining in Saul's family? And I wonder if those officials for David looked a little puzzled when he asked that question. Particularly when they found out it was because he wants to show them kindness. An unnatural response to a new king. And this is another characteristic I want to suggest to you that makes David a person after God's own heart. David is going to keep his promises. He is going to keep this covenant that he made with Jonathan. Probably no one knew about this covenant aside from David and Jonathan and Jonathan has been killed in battle. So there's no one around to ensure that David is keeping this promise. David has no accountability to anyone other than himself. David could have made a, no, a number of excuses for not keeping the promises. The promises. For one, he could say Saul was cruel and relentless. And why should I show kindness to his house when he treated me so badly? That's a good question. Or he could have reasoned that David and Jonathan, that we were young men when we made this covenant and a lot of things have happened since then. Things have dramatically changed since we made this promise to one another. David could easily have reasoned this way. Now that I'm king, I don't have time to worry about these insignificant things. I've got to worry about running the kingdom of Israel, over, of Israel. And I have far more important things to do than to deal with this. Not the case. David kept his word. David kept his covenant. The words that David said to Jonathan years ago were not just idle words. David did or was going to do what he said he would do. And I want to suggest to you that that is a rare characteristic today. It's really rare when you find people that keep their word. <coughs> For a number of reasons, perhaps. But when you find someone that will keep their word, you have found a person who in the eyes of man receives both honor and integrity. I want to share with you two passages of Scripture. One from the book of Deuteronomy, which is over at the first part of your Bible, just three or four books in. And the other from Ecclesiastes, which is right in the middle of your Bibles, right after Psalms and Proverbs. Both of them deal with this matter of keeping your word. The first is Deuteronomy chapter number 23. In Deuteronomy 23, if you run your finger down to verse 21, I want to read with you how the easy standard version reads. It says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and if you will be guilty of sin, but if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips. 
For if you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. In another passage I mentioned, Ecclesiastes, this is from the King Solomon. Most think Tom Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. That's David's son. Notice what David's son says on this subject. Chapter number 5 of Ecclesiastes, verse number 4 and 5. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay it. God demands, brethren, that we keep our word. That we fulfill our promises. And this passage in Ecclesiastes says we fulfill those promises quickly. Quickly. You take care of your responsibilities. Now that could be in a lot of different areas. It could be in the way you talk and the promises you make verbally. It could also be in commitments you make financially. You make you borrow money or you make a loan. Pay those bills. Pay your debts. Do what you say you're going to do. In fact, God says that we ought not to make commitments if we can't fulfill it. If you don't see your way of keeping your promise, don't make the promise. Often you see parents making promises to children and something comes up and they're not able to keep that promise. What kind of message is that sending to those children? Keep and do what you say you're going to do. Our world, or our word rather, should be our bond. And this is a standard that God expects from us. Sometimes, however, we find it difficult. Sometimes circumstances of life makes it hard to keep those promises. I want to just use an illustration to make a point. And the illustration I want to use is that of marriage. That of marriage. Just this last several months, I've talked to two or maybe three different people that are having problems with their marriage. And here's what they say. They say, my spouse that I married is a different person than they were when we were dating. They are not the same person now. They're different altogether. And if that happens to you, are you going to keep your vow of marriage? Are you going to keep that promise that you made till death do you part? Your spouse cheats on you. Do you keep your vow of fidelity? Even though they may be seeing another person. Sometimes the honeymoon moments turn to dirty diapers and sleepless nights. And fragile and frayed emotions. And it turns out that's not what you was expecting in this arrangement. Are you going to fulfill your vow? You see, often we see people today that give up on those vows that they make before men and before God. And they discard those vows for a little, almost any circumstance. That is not what God wants from His children. God says, if you're not going to keep the vow, don't make it. He expects people to be like David and remember those promises that you made. So back to the question that David asked. Is there yet any left in the house of Saul? Well, the answer David was given was yes. Jonathan's got a son. Jonathan's got a son, and his name is Mephibosheth. And he lives down here at Lopatar. And Lodabar is a is a is a an isolated, desolate place. The word Lopatar means without pasture. Poor soil. A difficult place to raise anything. It was not a desirable place to live. And the servants of Saul go and they bring Mephibosheth before the king. And it seems that Mephibosheth was fearful for the meeting because why would David be calling me? 
He is a descendant of Saul, and normally if the king calls a descendant of a previous king, it's just for one purpose, and that is to take his life. Kill him and get him out of the way. And so this young man was fearful. So David began in verse number 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 9 by saying, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And this indicates that there was some fear in this young man. David tells Mephibosheth that he's going to show him kindness because of the promise he made to his father, Jonathan. David said, I'm going to restore all of Saul's fields to Mephibosheth's family and he was going to himself eat at the table of David in the palace in Jerusalem. And what an update to a standard of living. This man was living down here in a place of desolation. Now the king says, I'm going to give you some rich, fertile soil where you can work, your family can work with their hands and they can be productive. And you're going to be right here in the palace with me because of the promise I made to your daddy. Well, here's Mephibosheth's response. Verse number 8. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? The people she had, had no self-image or a very low self-image. He saw himself no better than a dead dog and perhaps one of the reasons for that was because he was crippled he couldn't walk. He was a handicap. So he asked that question, but David does not answer that question, but simply he enacts what he says he's going to do. The land will be returned to the family of Saul. No longer will they have to live in Lodabar without pasture. Now they'll be able to farm and make provision for their own families and their servants. And this young man, the people said, will be eating at the table with David. Can you sort of imagine him sitting at the, in the palace around the table and you got David and you got Abigail and you got David's children, so a number of them. And there the people sitting right there with them. This boy had done nothing to deserve this blessing. David, though, was showing loving kindness in keeping the covenant of love. And this story goes to show us a great representation of God who keeps His covenant of love toward us. If you're in the book of Deuteronomy a few moments ago, I want you to go back in chapter number 7 this time. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning in verse number 9, the text says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. He repays in the face of those that hate Him by destroying them. He will not be slack for the one who hates Him. He will repay Him to His face. But he says He keeps the covenant with steadfast love. In place of steadfast love, some versions substitute the word of loving kindness. And that's the idea. God is a Expending to us gracious, loving kindness that is, promised, that is promised to the obedient. He's promising this kindness to those who keep His commandments. And brethren, I trust that's you and that's me. Every rainbow in the sky should remind you of the covenant that God made with Noah to never destroy the earth again with water. 
God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants that they would receive a land and that through his descendants that they would be a great nation and through his descendants all nations of the earth would be blessed. And God keeps his promises. I'm going to close with one final scripture. And I'd like you to turn over there with me if you have your Bibles. It's in Titus chapter 1. Verse number 1, verse number 2. The beginning of that book. The text reads, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. I want you to underline in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised for the ages began. So Paul begins this letter to Titus by describing a hope that we have of eternal life. And it's because God made this promise before the world was ever created. God promised that there would be a way that man could be saved. And there's nothing that we did to cause God to make this covenant. There's nothing that we did that forced God to promise us eternal life. He did that because He loves us. All that we see is God's faithful covenant of love. It's almost like we live in Lodabar. And, and God is knocking on the door. And He's given us an invitation to come to the table and eat with the Father. Come and dine with me. You can almost imagine Mephibosheth saying, Oh, I'm going to go back down there and live in Lodabar. I don't want to go to the king's palace. I don't want to partake of the king's royal food. It's crazy to think anyone would deny all those blessings and benefits. But spiritually speaking, brethren, we have the same promises. God is knocking on our door. And He's asking us to leave Lodabar and come to a heavenly place, a heavenly Jerusalem, and feast with the Lord. Come to my Father's house that we talked about this morning. And the reason God is making that offer is because He loves us and because He made a promise before time ever started of eternal life. Paul tells us in Titus 1 verse 2, He made that promise before the ages began that eternal life would be made available. And God keeps His promises. We do not deserve this offer. But Phoebusheth, he responded by saying, he's like a dead dog. Why are you taking interest in me like a dead dog? You know, to some degree we could say the same thing. Lord, God, why are you care about me? Why did he care about you? I mean, look at our life. We're just a little speck in history. Why does He have concerns for us? Because He loves us. And because we are His creation. And He has made available to us spiritual blessings. God is offering you and offering me eternal life. God is offering you and is offering me a seat in His house. God is offering you and He's offering me every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ. In His body. 
question for the evening is, are you in Christ? How does one get into Christ? Galatians chapter 3, verse number 7, he's baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse number 3, he's baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13, he is baptized into Christ. So the real question for the evening, have you been baptized scripturally, properly, for the remission of your sins? If you haven't, the night is a good time to take care of that. As we stand together and sing the song that Larry is about, it's an invitation song. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad.
We'll sing the first and third, and after that, uh, uh, he's got the closing prayer. First and third, and number 273. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way. Son Jesus Christ and be able to pray through Him and all the hope and all the love and all the, the faith that we have through Him, dear Lord. As we've just learned at the end of this lesson that we can have hope of eternal life in Him. We pray, dear Lord, that each and every one of us continue to strive and to become closer to Your Son Jesus Christ, to You through Him, through His Word, that we study your word daily, that we use it, dear Lord, to make ourselves better and those around us. We pray, dear Lord, for all the sick that has been mentioned today, and we pray that you be with them and the caretakers and their loved ones, for those who have upcoming surgeries, who, for those who are who are uh, recuperating. We pray, dear Lord, thank you for the church here at Blodgett. We thank you for the elders that work here. We thank you for Larry that works here and the many that work behind the scene. We pray, dear Lord, that you just help us to be the Christian people we need to be. That let us get better each day. We pray, dear Lord, that as as we do fall, dear Lord, that we just get right back up, ask for forgiveness, and get back to work. We pray that you watch over us and keep us. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. Okay, Claire, you go straight home now. All right. <laughs> 